I was born in, in, in October of 1924. I'm in the youngest, I was, I was the youngest of four children. Uh, I was born and raised in West Philadelphia. I went to the Philadelphia Public Schools and um, that was in the time of the Depression. And my brother had a newspaper route. And when he went off to Drexel at night, I took over that, I eventually took over that newspaper route for him when I was 12 years old. I continued to serve until I graduated from Overbrook High School in, in West Philadelphia. Uh, as part of that, I had a newspaper route that was fortunate. I had one in the morning and in the afternoon because I served newspapers to the Women's Hospital in West Philadelphia. It was right down the street from me. And in that experience, I saw the morning record go out of business, newspaper, and the evening ledger go out of business. And that was time just in the, uh, in the late 30s. Um, we walked all the way to, I walked all the way from where I lived at uh, around 42nd and Lancaster Avenue in West Philadelphia all the way up to 59th and Lancaster Avenue to go to the Overbrook High School and that was, we were known as the Hilltoppers up in there. And we walked up every day, snow, never, we had never had a snow day. Hmm. And in those days, the uh, milk was delivered by horse and buggy and they would be there in the morning and in the cold weather to keep the milk from freezing up through the top of the bottle, they would pack ice around it to keep the milk a little warmer. Huh. But I never saw a snow day, but every day we went to school huh. and uh, we had no, could have gone up by public transportation. I did sometimes, but generally I walked up there or I rode a bicycle home. Um, on December 7th, 1941, I went to church that evening to a young people's group and that is when I found out about Pearl Harbor. And I rushed home to my parents and told them about what had happened. The next day in high school, I was in my senior, senior year then, um, the principal gathered all the students into the auditorium and, and told them about this disaster that happened out in Pearl Harbor. I did volunteer to go into the Navy, but for some reason or other they rejected me. And then I was inducted into the uh, Air Army. I went out to, my first place was out to Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. Now, when, when did you, when were you inducted, do you remember? I think I went in on my mother's birthday, which was April 22nd. That was when I went in, in 1943 that would be. Uh, I went to uh, Indian Town Cap and got pre found out all the roughness and the foul words and everything you learned in the Army mm -hmm. there. And then I went from there down to Greensboro, uh, South Carolina for basic training. At that time I volunteered to go into the Air Force. And then I went from Greensboro, North Carolina to Scottfield out in Illinois for radio school. Um, it was interesting at that time to realize that the military knew this war was coming to an end. And they figured that they had enough radio operators. So then I went from there down to, uh, in Texas, uh, I can't think of the name offhand. Harrington? No, that was not it. Uh, and, and to a gunnery school. And that was my first time flying down there. And my first flight was flying in the back of a two-seater, open-seater plane huh. uh, with a machine gun in there. And they had in the targets out over the, um, the, the bay there, the, um, that would be the, off of Texas, that's called the, what order is that? The, the Gulf of Mexico? The Gulf Coast, the Gulf. Yeah. And they had streamers out there in the water anchored down there. And my position was to take the gun and shoot bullets into that as we were flying onto this open seat plane. And I was short. And I could see those things down there. And I had to, sometimes I had to hold the gun up here. I couldn't see and see where I was hitting in the water because I couldn't see in the top of the gun. Yeah. 
and then I have to watch out. Well, I think I'm getting a little close to the tail of the plane, so I don't want to shoot that off. <laughs> I went from there then to uh, March Field in California. Met the crew, the crew was formed there, and after some flight trainings there, uh, going out and shooting air, uh, shooting the practicing gun on there, I was a ball turret, assigned the ball turret, but for some reason or other on the air to ground gunnery we were doing, the ball turret gun would not work. Hmm. And I had to pull the ammunition out of there and haul it up to, through the plane, through the bomb bay, and then down into the nose of the plane and try to shoot from there. That was the only time I ever got air sick, was lugging that ammunition, hmm. struggling it through the bomb bay and everything. That was the only time I ever got air sick. Huh. Uh, we trained there for a few months. Uh, we went to um, up in Northern California to pick up a brand new plane. We flew that plane from there down into someplace in, in Texas, refueled, then the next was a long flight, we refueled from, we flew from Texas up to um, Massachusetts, Bradley Field up in Massachusetts. And then from there we went from Bradley Field, we flew to Goose Bay, Labrador. We were there a couple days waiting for the weather to clear up. Then we flew from there over to Iceland. And in Iceland, we got stuck with the weather. At that time, we were flying over there in just at the time of D-Day. Okay. So that was the summer months, and we flew that route. That was the better route. But in the winter months, the uh, planes flew, to my understanding, down through the Azores. Okay. Yeah. And then went over to Europe. But we flew from, then I flew from uh, Iceland to, um, over to England, and I think we landed in Wales, left the plane there, went by train, troop train then to uh, Harrington. And uh, we found out then we were not to say anything about the weather, where we were, or anything. And the only thing my, my parents knew was I had an address, it was POE address, someplace. They did know because I, I, that I was in England as opposed to the Pacific. I went to, I went to basic training down there in, in uh, South Carolina, and then I went out to Scott Field, which was a radio school out there, and they used the dot dash system when, when the, uh, when learning how to use that. Morse code. Morse code. Uh -huh. uh, I was out there for a while, and they, they said that they made it difficult to graduate, and I didn't complete that, so I went down to the gunnery school down in Texas. And where's Scott Field? Scott Fields in Illinois, across, okay. across from St. Louis. Okay. Just out in Belleville, Illinois. Okay. Um, and um, down there then in, in, in uh, Texas, uh, we went to, um, I can't think of the name of that baseball hand, but um, to practice gunnery there. Of course, basic training, I practiced with a rifle down there, laying on, on the targets and all. But down there, it was with machine gun training and all. Uh, as part of the training, they, they had me stand in the back of a back of a pickup truck, mm -hmm. and this pickup truck would go around a uh, track, and every so often they would shoot out these skeets, skeet shooters. Oh, so you had to try to. So, that, so that the, to get the training to the, me, the, I being moving and a target being moving right. at the same time. Sure. That was part of the training to do on that. Then eventually we got out and did it in flying, doing training that way. Uh, that, that was very interesting, that base down there, because it's subjected to uh, Harlington, Texas, that's where it was. Um, subject to the uh, uh, tornado, uh, hurricanes down there, right. the, the, the barracks had a pitch roof like that and come down. But down there they took the pitch roof and where the, then they continued on with a tie wire down into the ground. Hmm to keep from the roof blowing off. And how many times we tripped over those doggone wires, I, it's unbelievable. Why, did, why was your unit uh, collectively called the carpet baggers? Well, the, the Army had 
various code names that they were they come up with a bunch of code names. Mm -hmm. And for some reason or other, when this group was formed, they came up with the name Carpet Bagger. Okay. I thought it was somewhat resemblance because you had the Carpet Bagger escape method during the Civil War. Right. You know, yeah. and I thought it was a tie in. And I asked this Colonel Fish about that. And he says, no, he says, that was not. That was not it. It was just so happened that that particular name was the next name they wanted to use for a secret unit. Okay. So it was just a coincidence that there was that yeah. resemblance. Got over there. One man decided not to fly anymore, and I moved into his position as a tail gunner because in that plane we were in a uh, the planes were painted black, and they took the ball turret out of that group, and that was what they called a Joe hole. We found out then that we were going to drop out supplies and uh, people out of the plane. Uh, a, the paint, planes were painted black. We had containers, maybe about this size, that we hung in the bomb right in the bomb racks to drop out at night. Where I was in the ball turret, they called that the Joe or Josephine hole, and we would drop out men or women out of that hole. Um, and also, we had the escape hatch at the back. We would open that up and drop some supplies out. Uh, we do, my understanding was that we dropped the supplies out at night at 400 feet and we dropped the people out to shoot at 600 feet at night. Uh, we flew just above stall out on those planes and when we got over to the site we would see, I couldn't see it being in a tail, but the, the bombardier, he could see it would be three lights in a row flashlights, and off to one end would be another one. And where we saw the two of them side by side, we knew that that was where we were to start dropping our supplies out. And we were flying upwind. So, and we got to the last flight, the, the bomb, we would stop dropping supplies out if we had any more on there. When the command would keep, don't stop it, we would go around again. I think when we had personnel, we dropped the personnel out first and then we drop the supplies out. And they would have a, the, the, the odd light off to the one side, he would blink a Morse code to us. And he would get that over the, over the BBC. At that mm -hmm. time, the BBC would say, say um, Joe's got a threepence in his left pocket. That was a clue. Mm -hmm. And the, the underground over there in York had their radios tuned up to know. And when they knew that group was coming in, that particular spot, they knew where we would come and when they heard us, then they would turn their lights on for us. And we would drop our supplies out to them. Uh, I can remember that first night, I think all of a sudden we were flying, I think we were on our way home, and all of a sudden a, a searchlight hit us. And then it went off. And it was our people from the ground forces saw that we were an American plane okay. in the B-24. Okay. And, and we went on, and I remember the navigator for coming back. We flew at night without any lights. And coming back, he decided to take up a, a, a initial point, reference point, over the Guernsey Islands, not knowing that they were occupied by, by the, the Germans, Germans all through the war. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we took some flack on that one, and a piece of flack did come in the plane about three or four feet from where I was. Mm. But we made it back, and when you landed at night, the, the field was dark, but the radio operator, well, on a plane we had an IFF uh, machine in there, identify friend or foe, and we turned that off when we were over Europe but we turned it on when we were in the in, into approaching England so that they would know who we were. And that would, my understanding, that was changed every day or periodically so that uh, all the things were that way. And we would, um, as we got on our final approach, they would turn the lights on for an instant until we got down on the ground. And then at the end of the, we would land and they would interview each one of us as to what we saw. Um, 
and they gave us, they had some uh, liquor there for us to drink to calm down our nerves. And being in the flight crew, we were, this was after the, I did, I got over there after, after D-Day. D-Day was in June and I got over there in August. Okay. Um, and at that time they had made some invoices. We used to get nothing but SOS to eat on the morning for our meals. Mm -hmm. uh, but and scrambled eggs. But when we got over there for the flight crew and landed at night, maybe five o'clock in the morning, we got there. They served the flight crew with eggs, and that was a real treat to get eggs for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> but um, and the interesting thing about all that, we were in the Midlands section, uh, just north of Northampton, in England, and. There were a lot of planes that you could see at night flying over there that you'd see circles for the outline of the plane, airline of the airfields and you would see them intersecting each other and that's how close the airfields were over there. Mm -hmm. um, and the planes were painted black. We would go into town and those town people never asked us what we were doing. They never knew what we were doing. They, they think that all we were doing was mostly was flying dropping leaflets to the uh, their German soldiers for free pass into to, to it. But they never asked us what we were doing. And we only flew on on moonlit nights. We could not fly at all at night. Um, I do remember coming back one time, and we always had to watch out for the RAF because they were making night raids. Right, yeah. And uh, we had to watch out that we didn't enter meet them. Uh, we were flying home, I think it was. Oh, we were boarding. We were coming back. Our plane was having problems. So we cut our flight short and went back. And all of a sudden, I was thrown to one side. The plane went up like that. And I looked out. And there was another one of our planes going the other direction. But you couldn't see anybody at night. That's, what, that's why we flew in moonlit nights. Uh. So we could see each other. But uh, we also, uh, after after York was uh, liberated, we went up into the Netherlands and dropped there, and then all the way up into Norway. And when we took off for Norway, it was daylight when we left, and it was daylight when we landed. We flew all night up to there. Uh, we, we did the Netherlands, where Norway was a very risky place because it was not, we had to watch out for the mountains. And we did lose some aircraft over there. Now, did you ever, uh, when you were flying over on these missions, did you ever uh, talk to the agents you were dropping? Did, were there any exchanges of any kind? I uh, couldn't speak English. I, I know the one we went out on, and the, the, the jump master says all we could say was, okay, okay, that was the only English they had. And they were trained, they were brought in. Uh, by night, or, or, or it's, they were brought in from another location in England. Mm -hmm. They had a, a, the OSS had some place over there to train these people mm -hmm. and to speak. Um, uh, Did you ever uh, on the missions you flew? How many people do you recall or estimate you you guys actually dropped yourself? I, I think we dropped at least three. And those would be one at, on separate missions? Not two of them at one time. Okay. The first mission we dropped two out. Okay. Yeah. Were they all men or were there also some no, women? No, they were all men. They were okay. all men. But they did drop women out of there. They called them Josephine. Right. Now what did you guys on these missions, would you, since some of these lasted all night, would you take food with you? Did you take no, anything to take drink? Any, we had some drink. Right. And. Um, we flew at night always with the oxygen mask on. Okay. I understand, I think in the daytime we only put oxygen mask on when you get up above 12,000 feet. Mm -hmm. But at night we had the oxygen mask on all the time. Hmm. So even when you were low level? Yeah, yeah. We had a briefing to say you're going to fly over this part of France or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know where it was. But the officers had their own briefing. Okay. Okay. And they would not talk to you about it? No, no, no.
Our, our biggest casualties were just crashes were usually at the bomb sites or at the drop sites. Um, sometimes we didn't have the, the, the after we left the drop zone, the hills were coming up like that, and we were not aware of that. We've had planes crash into the trees. Um, and that's a, where we most of our casualties were there. So there were accidents rather than enemy fire. Most that's of right. Them. That's okay. right. Um, they had um, there's a story of one plane went down in there, and one of the crewmen stayed there throughout the war and helped the underground, hmm. the French Mackies, do their operations. Huh. Um, and we always were told that if we went down in there. Um, Usually, a religious, a priest or somebody there would be the ones that could help you out. And uh, we were told never to take off our uniform unless the rescuer said, here, you take a uniform and we'll get you back. Um, they also, prior to my getting over there, they took a C-47, which was one of the uh, uh, passenger planes that, uh, prior to the war, and that was a real war horse over there. And they took that plane and landed it by flashlight in occupied France before the invasion. And I think they took a jeep over there, and dropped some people off, and brought some escaped prisoners back. But one of the people that we dropped out, they are really what we were, was the transportation group for the OSS. And that was the forerunner of what we now know as the CIA. And we dropped a man over there by Colby. I, I can't think of his first name, but he we dropped him off up in the in the in Norway with a set of skis. So that uh, we we was a very tight organization. It was founded, as I understand, is Rose uh, um, Churchill knew that the French were fighters and they would not take this to saying, sitting down with the occupation. And he was the one that came up to drop supplies to the under French underground to do that. Um, and the B-24 seemed to be the best plane to do it. There were a lot of B-17s over there, but the B-24 had a bigger capacity for dropping things. So that, uh, and we had connections with the, the uh, intelligence was done by through the British and the Americans as to what drop zones should be done. Uh, and what they made, we even took money, we dropped money to those people. And then they had a group there, the Jedborough, I think they're called. I never had anything experience with them. But they would drop them down and they had a radio that they could communicate. My understanding was the way the Jedborough, on the ground they had a, a transmitter that just went up straight like there and planes knew about where that would be, and they could fly over in that area and pick up the signals that were being given. Those are three-man teams, I think. Yeah, they yeah. were three-man yeah. teams. Yeah. Um, they told uh, in, in looking at the past in history about it, uh, there was one night they were told always how to come back into the into the, in the England to land from France, but one night they, for some peculiar reason. They were not so cold to come back that way, and it took them in a roundabout way, and I think they approached the British Isles from the west, hmm. not knowing at that time that because of that was all the activity for D-Day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they steered them away from that. Okay. Okay. You uh, mentioned something about uh, naming the planes. Can you tell us about your plane? Our plane was called, originally called the Brer Rabbit, and that had been there for several years. So you don't know who gave that name? I don't know who gave it to him, but <clears throat> our pilot uh, decided he wanted to change the plane, and he called it Cookie, after his wife. And there were artists on the base that would paint these nose things on the, mm -hmm. on the planes, and he got somebody to paint that on the ship, on, his, on our particular plane. A lot of the planes that you guys used in were hand-me-downs from regular squadrons that flew combat missions that they were, were then modified, modified somewhere? They were, well, I'm not sure they were all how old they were when we got them. 
but they did have to modify them. If they had been used in daylight bombing, right. uh, they had to be modified. Um, we took the nose turret out uh, and the ball turret to lighten the ship up for one thing, mm -hmm. and uh, there were several other modifications. That they, the B-24s, they had A, B, C, H, uh, B, H, and J, and I gave them different numbers, and I forget which ones. You type a unit. We, each one was di slightly different, right. you know, like but different Ford trucks. Sure. Yeah. And uh, that was the name they gave a, 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 a particular type they had on that. And the plane, of course, was painted black. Our other planes were all did not have were all silver. Right. But this was black to conceal the <coughs> light operations. Um, and the uh, they put an afterburner or something on underneath the the motor, the engine rather. So it would not glow at night. Okay. So the engines were the same engines they had in regular B-24s. They just modified them so you couldn't see the, the any of the... That, that's right. You couldn't okay. see it from ground. And before we started on a plane, we all had to get out and pull the props. Oh, okay. Of course, the engines, we had to keep it going. We had to, we had to pull the props to, to uh, do it. The oil, because the oil would be so thick. Now, what other planes did you have on your base? You showed us a picture of what looked like a, one of those British-made mosquitoes. Did, what other planes did you have on your base? I saw some, um, I think I saw some P-51s and P-47s in there. Okay. But we, it was basically all, all 24s. Okay. They, if, if they came in, they were, somebody was visiting. And apparently the, the officers had, an, had the freedom to do, go visit from one base to another. When, after the war was over, or, Really, the battles were narrowing, coming down to an end. Uh, I know I flew with the with the uh, squadron commander to go to some other base. He wanted to visit somebody. He had the privilege of taking the B-24 and visit with him. Oh. <laughs> we, the, the rule was that when you flew at night, you had to fly it up with oxygen. Right. So we had the oxygen. But the other way, we needed the, that insulated suit because it was so cold when we were flying it. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe eight or ten thousand feet mm -hmm. at night. It was cold in there, so we had a, we had the, the electric suit in there. Okay. And then we had we always had our oxygen mask on at night. Was there ever any danger? I mean, uh, of say say the electric suits have a short or something. Of course, you're breathing that oxygen. I mean, that could cause a serious fire. No, I never Was know anything like that. But I do know that um, you had to be very the oxygen tank. Uh, had to be very where you hooked up to it was very had to be very clean. Okay. Uh, because if a spark did occur yeah. with the oxygen, you, you that would be. That the was end. it. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. So I assume your electric suit was plugged into a completely different part of where the yeah. where your oxygen yeah. thing was. Okay. Harrington Light. Harrington was a, uh, a small town, um, and uh, there were not any big villages around us. The biggest town, I think, was Northampton which they ran uh, busloads of, of men into there at night. Um, I was in there a couple times, but there was a little town closer to it in Bricksworth, it was called Bricksworth, which was an old town. And in that particular town, there was a church. And I understand that that was the, I think about the second oldest living structure, or church structure in, in England. Hmm. And, and I did see that. Uh, and I had the opportunity religion? later in the 90s to go over there and visit and saw that church. My wife and I went over there. Yeah. But this town in, in Bricksburg, we would get in there on a truck that would take us, and then it, the Northampton people would back, would pick us up on the way back. And eventually I got a bicycle, so we would ride in there. Um, I was fortunate, our crew was fortunate, and we stayed in Quonset huts. Okay, because I no noticed on the video last night, it was mostly known as a tent city. There was a tent city there that some of the bomb groups were in, but the group that I was in, we were able to uh, stay in these in the um, Quonset huts. Uh, and then we had a little hike up to the mess hall, uh, and it was a very quiet town, uh, but the people in there never asked what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people in that town had moved into it through the war to get out of, out of the blitz in London. Mm -hmm. I, we did get a pass uh, for a couple of days, and we went into London, the, the bunch of us. And, and that was quite a sight. 
getting in there and you would walk around the piles of rubble from those buildings. At that time, the buzz bombs were coming over. Mm -hmm. And when the, air, the uh, uh, aircraft was, there had no German aircraft at that time. And that was quite a pathetic thing to go down and see those piles of rubble and then to go down into the subway at night and see the bunk beds in there and people tucking their children in the bed. You know, that was a very depressing thing. I do know that we got over there and we were going up or down an escalator in the subways. And we did see another group that we had trained with over in, in March Field. But they were not part of our bomb group and we got to meet with them. But they were going down and we were going upward and we didn't quite finish when get together. Probably just as well, you couldn't have told them what you were doing anyway. No, no, we couldn't tell them. Yeah. And, no. and um, uh, the, the, they, were, they were stationed, a lot of the, the, the Daybind groups were stationed over Norwich, which is on the east coast right. of, yeah. um, of England. And they did have a plane under the, an airfield over there, I understood, that a plane could come down there and make a, a dead landing and not many breaks. The, the, bleak, the, build, the runway was so long that they would be able to stop the plane if, it, if their hydraulic system oh, lost. Oh. Now, since you were on such an unusual mission, since, of course, the, the strategic bombing of Germany, as you said, you said RAF flying there, carpet bombing missions at night, and the USAAF flying their precision bombing <laughs> runs during the day, you guys, of course, were nocturnal. You were going in uh, at night, so it, it put your whole schedule backwards. So you would sleep during the day. Your ground crews got to work in the daylight rather than at night repairing the planes. Yeah. So what was that like? I mean being on a, 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 well, a schedule that's reversed if everybody back and else. We would be sleeping in the morning and I would hear these planes run hour after hour, the daylight plane, because then we had the equipment was mediocre compared to what we had today. Yeah. And those planes would take them hours to get up high enough to fly in, well, they would be up over 12,000 feet. And it took them hours to fly around and get up there and I understand that they also had some planes painted a particular color. And they would be the planes to round up all the other planes. As they're flying up in there, gosh, you don't know who this guy is next to you. Right. But you'd look for a particular plane, and that's the way they would assemble the groups over there. Hmm. But we would hear them droning on. Well, it took them maybe even an hour to get up that high. We, 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 we didn't get into town much during the daytime. We would go in, in after dinner and ride in, and they would take trucks in there. Um, we would have to do clean up around the place. Uh, we didn't have to work, I don't ever remember working in the, and doing any KP work. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the daytime was pretty leisure for us, and we would get together, and it was the officers and and enlisted people, we just met together, we didn't have any of the saluting, we had to do, do the saluting to, to officers at times. Mm -hmm. But to our own crew, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. um, I figured that I had gotten most of my missions in when I was 19 years old. Now what was your rank at the time, were you tech sergeant? Or what? I, was, I started out, um, I think I went over there as a PFC. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I got to be a, a staff sergeant, okay. which has two rockers on me. Okay. Um, after at combat, we had them there, and I believe I understand also that uh, the British did not make their pilots officers. Not necessarily, but, yeah. Right. But the United States did. Right. Yeah. For the simple reason they found out that the officers were treated better than the the. the uh, um, uh, the lower ranks. But the, the, the food over there was, uh, we always had that uh, uh, dried beef on toast. That was one of the big staples over there. SOS. Yeah, yeah. SOS. Right. <laughs> and um, uh, scrambled eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and they did have, I think, some POWs serving oh. in the kitchen. Interesting. But we got paid by the, the was British pound. Okay. And um, Boy, it changed. It seems to me 
that a pound was worth four dollars in those mm -hmm. days. That sounds about right. Yeah. Now, did you we, did you have the option of receiving part of your pay in dollars, which could then be put in account in the U.S. automatically, or how did, how could you know? I had part of it taken out and to purchase a war bond, mm -hmm. and which was sent to my mother. Okay. So you didn't have any. Uh, so you have, and also as, as a flight crew, um, I was. I was a staff sergeant there, but I got a higher pay because if I put in a certain X number of hours a month, mm -hmm. I got the pay increase for flight, for flight insurance. The, the, the pubs over there, they were, their, their beer was, was never cooled. And as a matter of fact, I've seen people in the pubs over there take a hot poker and put it in the beer to warm it up. Huh. But the, the pubs over there, they had uh, fireplaces in them. Uh, they didn't have any, to my knowledge, there was no central air in there. Uh, and, uh, but we, we, we had a good time. The crew, the crew always went together, traveled together. So did your missions then stretch out from uh, the summer of 44 into the spring of 45, or were your missions pretty much... I think they were pretty much over by the uh, end of uh, 44. So what did you do then the rest of the time? Well, we had a few missions at night. We went uh, up, uh, I, I guess in 45, or we early part of 45, we went up into Norway and into um, uh, the, the Netherlands. Okay, you did. You, your group. Yeah, our group did. We, we flew over that. Okay. I was very interesting to fly over the Netherlands to see all that water running around there. Sure. Flying at yeah. night. So th th this, these were missions to just drop leaflets at that point in the war. No, we dropped we dropped supplies over there okay. in the Netherlands and also up in Norway. Okay. Because I know in the uh, by the time the Netherlands was liberated in '45, well, those people were starving to death, and they were yeah. runs food runs over to drop food to civilians. And so we on. never dropped. In my knowledge, we never dropped food. Okay. I never knew. We never knew what was in the containers. Oh, okay, okay. And they were these long, we, the, the th what they showed on the uh, on the video anyway, these long cylinders. That's right. That would be loaded with different, you know, food or yeah. ammunition yeah. or arms or radios or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever drop anything that wasn't in one of those cylinders? We dropped some bundles out of, out of the, out of the uh, okay. escape hatch. Just soft bundles? Of yeah, yeah. Now these leaflets, um, last night it was saying they were called nickels because uh, they had 4,000 leaflets in a batch and they called, oh. you guys called them nickels? I well, remember that name, no. Oh, okay. I was uh, going to ask you what the origin of that was, no, how, how, how 4,000 leaflets became a nickel. Uh, but, okay. So did you ever see any of these leaflets? Did you, did, did you take any? No, you could never see them. Anyway, they went out, uh, I guess we flew them out, out the waste winters when we flew them out. Okay. So would they, but would, we also would fly out to um, one of the things when there was no activity, but we would fly out, I can't think of the name of it, but it was like tinsel. Oh, anti-radar stuff. Yeah, yeah and jamming stuff. we dropped stuff, them yeah. out. See, we had to drop them out every so many seconds or something like that okay, right. to drop them out. Yeah. And then that was to throw the radar off. Right, right, yeah. Well, now, when you when you toss these leaflets out, would the bundles come apart in the air and then they just sort of scatter yeah, like that? yeah. yeah. And that was the same way with the, with the passes. We, the missions ran out, and uh, what we did then, we flew out and we dropped leaflets okay. out to Bombay. Okay. And we would drop them out. Um, but the combat activities for us it really ceased, and what they did with the planes and at the Battle of the Bulge, um, Patton was out of ammunition, or out of fuel. Mm -hmm. And they put huge tanks in the bomb bays and, and filled them up with fuel. And they flew them over to, uh, to, um, to Europe to, uh, to supply uh, his tanks. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was a daylight mission, and they didn't need the gunners on that. They were just all the officers did all that, and the flight engineers. Well, I heard about it, and um, I don't know if we had any celebration or not. Uh, I can't quite think. I was not in town at that particular day, but uh, uh, it was a great celebration, uh, and there was a lot of activity at the pub, of course, or in the, in the uh, PX, rather, mm -hmm. where the uh, party was going on. Uh, we did have 
uh, movies shown at night in, in there. We could go see a movie when we were not flying at night. They had a, a movie where you all sit on benches in there. To, and uh, they did have some dances in there that the local girls would come in. So when did you when did you uh, go back to the U.S. then? From I got Britain. back to the U.S. I guess uh, let's see, VE Day was what in uh, early May. Early May. I guess I got uh, I got back here in June. Probably. Did you fly or take I a boat? I flew back. I come back with another crew. I was the only one for some reason or other. I got called out of everybody else uh, on our crew and and. Um, Crews had been somewhat disbanded, and I was one of the first ones to come back. And I flew. I don't even know who the pilot was. I flew back with, but we flew back into uh, into Bradley Field, uh, <clears throat> and then from there, I came home. Um, and in those days, it was entirely different. Now everybody was on there, and I had luggage. All my had cat, all my luggage I was carrying with my bag, baggage. I picked up a cab at the 30th Street Station and. Uh, Drove it home, or no? I came home. I'm sorry. I went from from uh, Bradley Field out to, I guess it was Indian Town Gap. Mm -hmm. That's where I was out there, and they they um, then sent me home. They dispersed us from there. All the people from Pennsylvania went back from there, and um, that was leave though. That wasn't that wasn't discharge, right? No, that was a 30-day leave. Mm -hmm. That was a 30-day leave I had, and I come home and. Um, all my luggage, I had to drag it home, but I did call on that when, when going from Bradley Field to Indian Town Gap. I think it was on a Sunday, and we made a, a change in trains at Broad Street Station, which no longer exists. And I got down there and I called my mother, and she says, well, "Where are you?" And I told her where I was. My father was home, and he hopped on a trolley to get down to Broad Street Station mm -hmm. and meet me. And I continued to talk to my mother. I told her, I said, well, here's the number I'm calling from. Because in those days, on a toll, on a toll phone, if you talked after three minutes, you had to start putting money in the thing. Right, yeah. So she called me back on that one. So that was the first she had known that I was home. So obviously you didn't get, weren't able to give her any advance notice because you, you got... Well, I could probably call her, but the phones were hard to get back then. No, I mean from the UK. You didn't... Oh. You obviously must have been told at the last minute, not enough time to send her a letter or something that you I don't think I would have been permitted to do the thing like that. Oh, then. okay. I don't know. Oh. But no, I didn't do that. Um, I know, and there would be periods, so I think I told her when I was leaving March Field, and I said, well, you may, may not be hearing me from me for a while because I'll be moving. Yeah. That's all you could say. That's all you could say. Yeah. But she called, and my father did run down there to, to Broad Street Station. And then eventually, uh, I, I was sick when I got home at, at Indian Town Gap that day, that time. And I was in the sick bay for a couple of days, and then I came home. So, uh, when I got home, my mother never knew I was coming or not. Fortunately, she was home when I got home. Huh. I, wouldn't, I don't know how they got in the house. So, you, you had your 30 day leave, and, and what did you do with that 30 days? Well, I. I uh, I saw the neighbors. None of my friends were around. Okay. Um, they, they my closest friends, uh, they were. We were all in the service, and one of them I know was out in the Pacific at the time. And I don't know where the where the other one. They they were. There were two Navy guys. Two, there were three of us piled together, and two and the two of them went into the Navy. So when did you go to Davis Month? You said at some point. Well, that was, um, I got my, uh, I was sent home from Indian Town, Cap to Philadelphia, and then I had traveling orders, and I think I went all the way from Philadelphia out to, uh, Sioux Falls. Okay. Sioux Falls. I was out there for a while, and, um, then they, they sent me down to Davis Monson. Now, was there any hint that you might be headed to the Pacific, or were you? Yes, yes, there was a concern that we would go have to go. To, that was one of the reasons they sent us back early. A lot of my friends come back, went over by the boat and come back by the boat. Mm -hmm. 
I was fortunate to fly both ways, and the understanding was that this group was going to reform and work on the Pacific mm -hmm. battle zone. But the, but the war ended in, in between while we were home. But that was the understanding. We were going out there to, uh, to the uh, uh, to serve in the Pacific. So, so what did you do at Davis Monson? You said there were prisoners, German prisoners there who... Well, at, at, that was at a, a place where they were discharging a lot of people. Okay. At the end of the war, you had a point system. Right, yeah. And, and I was I was fortunate I had quite a few points because I got points for being in, in combat, on a flying on the airplane, right. and then being in a war zone. Uh, along with the number, of, I was in there for uh, 30, 30 months at that time. Mm -hmm. So I had enough points, but I couldn't get out right away. Mm -hmm. So what I did was to go work in an office in there and uh, could go through the paperwork for other people to dis be discharged. So that's what you did at Davis Month? Yeah. Okay, so then how did you end up in, uh, so is that where you were discharged as well? Davis Month, yeah. Okay, and when would, what was that? What, do you remember? Was that the That was in October. Okay, I was so. Saying, I was down there in, in October 45. Okay. Because I turned 21. That week I was discharged from Davis Month. Okay, so.